Good afternoon. We have our uh, first exam is next week. I'm going to give it online. It'll be on Moodle, 15 multiple, co multiple choice questions. Um, you'll have 75 minutes to take it from the time you start it. Uh, you can take it any time from Monday to Friday next week. Uh, instead of our regular class on Monday, I will uh, we'll have an optional exam review. So I'll be here to basically review the material for the exam. You can come in if you want to. It's up to you. Okay? Uh, so I've got the topics on there. I talked about these last time. I didn't go into much detail though, so I'll just run through these real quick. Uh, so we're going to cover the Risk V ISA. So we'll have questions where you have to um, write or you know pick the right, the correct sequence of instructions to perform a given operation, or maybe to pick the assembly code that that implements the functionality of a corresponding C code line. Um, make sure you're familiar with R, I, U, B, and J type instructions. I'm going to cover B and J type instructions today. Uh, and then control hazards is another topic I'll get to today. Hopefully, if I don't, then I obviously won't ask them on the exam. Uh, we're going to cover microarchitecture, which is the, the, all the material that we're in right now. Uh, make sure that you're comfortable with fixed point arithmetic. We use that for the um, square root code, which was lab one and you'll be using it again for the test code for your, your CPU for lab three. So we use a lot of, we use a lot of fixed point in this course. Um, logic circuits is kind of the conceptual part of the, of the course that I started out with. Uh, what is a, make sure you understand combinational versus sequential logic and the rules for sequential logic design. Basically sequential circuits can't, ha uh, I'm sorry, combinational circuits can't have a loop in them. They can't use their outputs as an input, whereas sequential logic is allowed to do that. Um, <clears throat> and then logic values, we talked about four-state logic that, that's used in System Verilog, where you have zero or one, but then there's you know, other miscellaneous values in there uh, to aid in simulation, like high impedance and, and don't care and don't know and undefined and conflict. Um, and then uh, we talked obviously about hardware description language and system Verilog in particular. Uh, I talked about simulation versus synthesis. Uh, that is, you know, the simulator and the synthesizer use completely different compilers. It's, they're, they're very different from one another. Uh, it's, a, it's a different, you know, and, and obviously you, you can put things in your system Verilog code that can't be synthesized. Like for example, if you put a that little pound sign or hash sign that, that indicates a delay, that automatically disqualifies your code from being synthesized. That's only for you know, simulation purposes. Um, and um, uh, always, always with no sensitivity list, the always that runs forever. I don't believe that can be synthesized. You know, we use those for you know, test benches to drive the clock. Uh, so. Uh, and then uh, behavioral versus structural HDL is behavioral is like a block diagram or a schematic that just defines the interconnections between modules that you put in and behavioral is Boolean logic and memory uh, essentially. Um, and, then, um, and then system Verilog syntax, we talked quite a bit about that. We didn't cover very much of system Verilog but we did, we did talk about a bunch of things. Um, Modules, continuous assignment, which is the assign statement. You can do that outside of a, uh, an always block. Uh, number representation, bit manipulation, reduction operators, the always statement, uh, sensitivity lists, default assignments. I didn't talk about that much, but a default, default assignments are, are a way that you can ensure that your always statement doesn't generate memory when you don't intend it to. So a default assignment will assign all of the possible outputs before you get to any if statements. Because once you get to if statements, then depending on how the always statement is evaluated and which path of the if statements the code takes, you may not ever assign one of the outputs. And if that happens, the, the synthesizer will put a latch in there. And usually uh, that's bad. That, that, that'll substantially reduce your, your clock rate that you can get with your synthesized circuit. Uh, so th that's the, the deal with that. Just make sure that you always assign every output in an always that, you know, in, an always that is intended to be combinational logic. Of course, if it's se sequential logic, then you may not always want to assign all your outputs, right? 
like if, if you're if you're intending you're assigned to be a, a register, then you you know then then if, for example if it's not enabled, then you don't change the output. But in that case, you intend there to be a flip flop in there. Does that make sense? Or did I just confuse everyone with that? <laughs> Okay, so, so the idea is that an always statement could be used for combinational logic or sequential logic. So if you use it for combination, now you might say, why would I use it for combination? I can use an assigned statement. Yeah, that's generally what I do. But some, sometimes you want to use an assign even for combinational logic, which is what we will do in the CPU for the control unit just because it's this massive if then else. We don't want to try to build that into an assign. It would be ugly because you'd have to use a ternary operator. A uh, big nested ternary operator. Um, and then sequential logic is basically whenever you have always at pause edge clock, right? O or actually always underscore FF at pause edge clock, right? And there, I, I talked about there's some variations on the syntax with that. But essentially, if it's a clocked always statement, it's sequential logic. If it's always, always at star or always underscore com, then it's combinational. Um, Blocking versus non-blocking assignment, that's the, the equals versus the less than equals to assign a signal and set an always statement. That's super confusing. It still confuses me, frankly. Uh, but basically, within the context of a single always statement, it, it just means that when you assign something with a equal sign, that's a blocking assignment. And so subsequent statements inside that always will see the updated value. Whereas if you use a... Um, less than equal sign, that's non-blocking, and that means the assignments won't take place until the assignment is done evaluating, right? Now, I don't think, I'm probably wrong about this, so I shouldn't say it, but I don't think I've ever run into a case where blocking and non-blocking made any difference in combinational logic. This is something that's specific to sequential logic, clocked always, right? So, I mean, I, it, just in my experience, it, when, whenever I use an always for like a big if then else or a case statement, it usually doesn't matter, right? But if you use always a pause edge clock, then the blocking versus non-blocking assignment matters, in which case you, you probably should stick to using the non-blocking, at least that's what the textbook recommends. Okay. Um, okay, and then uh, registers and RAMs. And of course, test benches. Test benches. Uh, I mentioned in class that you don't need a test bench to test to test a module. You could just use Tickle. Tickle is the scripting language that ModelSim uses. Tickle can test a module, um, but th th generally, it's recommended that you use a test bench, a Verilog test bench. And when I when I say test bench, it's basically something that drives the input signals, and then ideally would also check the outputs to make sure they're correct as well. Right? Okay, and that's it. Those are all the topics. Any questions about those? And I, like I said, I'll do a review next Monday. I'll work through some examples. Oh, and also, quiz three is due today, uh, and I'll go over quiz three on Monday. So if you're curious, if you have a question about quiz three or something wasn't clear, then I'll explain that on Monday. So obviously, you'll be able to take the exam starting from midnight on Monday. So you could take the exam before we even have class on Monday, but I recommend that you, you know, you, you can wait and come to the review and then you can take it any time during the week, okay? Okay, so where were we last time? Uh, one of the things I, I, I got the impression that I didn't get across very well was this idea between asynchronous and synchronous reads. And this is really important because um, you have to understand this to get the CPU working. To get, to get the pipeline CPU working. And basically the idea is, is that with a synchronous RAM, the output of that read port on the RAM, like if you just think of the read port, right? You're going to read a value. The output of the read, the read value from the RAM, is, is the contents of the address that was put in the previous cycle. I didn't explain it that way last time. I think that's a more... I, I think that's a clearer way to explain how that works, right? So if you look at the output of a synchronous read, it just means that the output is reflective of the address that was given to the RAM in the previous cycle, right? Because there's a one cycle delay to perform the read. So if I want to read an entry in a RAM, I got to give it an address, wait till the next cycle, right? That's not the way the register file works. So the register file is an asynchronous RAM 
and it will give you the contents of the register immediately, right? Within what, like a zero cycle latency, right? So you give it an address and it'll spit out the contents of that address. You know, in model sim, it's instantaneous. In real life, in real hardware, there is, there's obviously, there's a propagation delay that happens through the register file. But it's, whatever that propagation delay is, it is by definition less than a clock cycle, right? Significantly, I mean, ideally it would be much less than a clock cycle, right? So that's the difference. In our CPU, the instructions are coming out from an, a, a synchronous RAM which is why we need one cycle, well, it's part of the reason we need one cycle to fetch, because it takes one cycle to read the instruction, right? It's also the reason why when you're simulating your CPU, your program counter is going to be ahead of the instruction. So your program counter will always be the address of the next instruction as compared to the one that's being executed now. You guys, that makes sense? So it's like PC, it's like the program counter is going to be one when you're executing the first instruction, and it'll be two when you're executing the second instruction. So there's going to, there's going to be a mismatch there. Yes? So I, I understand like the off by one thing, and I was about to ask you, what does it do for the first one? Because the first one has instruction one, yeah. executing instruction zero. Yeah, yeah. So that one is, um, that was the reason I put in some code specifically to deal with that case. Um, somewhere. Yeah. Um, well, that's the ALU. Did I, do I not have it here? Oh, this must be an older, uh, hold on a second. Um, Oh, yeah, sorry. Wait, well, uh, let me fix that. Oh. Sorry, I had that older version of the slides up. Okay, here we go. Okay, when I was talking last time about how you get started on lab three, uh, I gave you the code for the fetch stage. So this is the C, so what I've done here is I've inlined the fetch inside the top level of the CPU. Some of you may think, you know, yeah, you probably should have put that in a module, but I just inlined it here. So kind of, I, I have the CPU and then inside the CPU, I just kind of have the, the scattered code in there that implements the fetch stage, okay? And in that code, I say that if I have a reset, then the program counter gets reset to zero, right? Which is reasonable, except the problem is, is that what happens to the instruction, like the program counter, as I mentioned, doesn't, doesn't immediately affect the instruction, right? Like you can reset the program counter, but like there's going to be still some garbage in the, the execute stage that's going to be processing, which represents whatever was fetched in the previous cycle, whatever happened before we reset, right? In other words, like leftover, it's kind of leftover data, right? There's leftover crap in there. So I have this, this line right here that says, if you're resetting, clear the program counter, but then force the instruction also to have a zero. So that kind of flushes the pipeline out. It kind of clears out whatever it might have been in instruction EX because, and I had to do that because there might have been residual data in there from before the reset, right? And resetting the program counter, it, like I said, is going to have a, a delayed effect on instruction EX. So that's what that line of code does, is it clears out whatever, if you reset, it, it reboots the machine, but it also flushes what's in the pipeline, right? Um, and so at the beginning it'll look weird though because you'll, you'll see You'll see um, the first instruction, it may look like it comes up twice um, at the beginning. It, it's a little wonky at the beginning when you reset just because of the pipeline nature. But I think um, when I tested this with Soyash, this version of the, of the, of the structure, uh, when we reset it, 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 it basically, you had a no-op, this is a no-op by the way, all zeros. 
which is actually not a no-op, it's actually a shift instruction in risk 5 but it, it shifts register 0, puts the result in 0, which doesn't have any effect, right? But technically, you know, it's supposed to be treated like a no-op. Um, so when you reset, you'll end up with a no-op in the execute stage and then um, you may end up with still, let's see, then after you reset, um, you're gonna, you should see the, 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 while you're resetting though, you're gonna be putting the PC fetch of zero into the, into the instruction RAM. So during the reset cycle, the instruction RAM, which doesn't know about reset, right, because RAMs don't have a reset, you can't reset a RAM. You can reset a register, but you can't reset. The only way to clear a RAM is to go through each address and write zero, right, one at one at a time. So, so the so the RAM will probably have the first instruction coming out, um, but it's going to be bypassed here by this if statement, right? So, it's, so, so normally you would just be you would be putting out what's in the instruction RAM on instruction ex, but because we're in reset, it's going to be doing that part, and you're going to be getting zero. But the soon as the soon as the reset, well, soon as the reset drops and then we get a positive edge of the clock, then you should have the first instruction uh, coming out there. So I think, um, is it two cycles? It's like one cycle you're in reset and then one cycle you're fetching the first instruction and then I think on the third cycle you actually have the instruction in there, if I remember correctly. Does that make sense? So you flush the pipeline on a reset and then it takes, I think, two cycles to finally get the first instruction in the fetch stage. I think it, it depends on when you drop, well actually in this case it doesn't because this is a synchronous reset. The re, I don't have reset in this always FF. Does that make sense? <laughs> I um, you know what, I could, uh, well let's find out actually because I think I still have this it's going to take a minute to fire up my uh, virtual machine, but well, I think I have it. I think I, I believe I still have this code on here, or maybe not. It's, I think it might be on my other system, but I can just copy and paste it and demo it. Yeah, it's going to take a, a minute to pop power up. Okay, while that's going, I'll, uh, um, okay, so that's the CPU, and then, um, we have top.sv, which is the, the FPGA with the special input names and output names that correspond to the pins on the FPGA. And then SimTop is a wrapper that goes around that, right? And SimTop is what stimulates the clock and the reset. And the switch inputs, by the way, too. Like, you're going to have simulated switches in the SimTop. So when you put a test value into the switches, the the virtual switches, it'll be in sim top, but then when you put top on the FPGA board, it'll be the actual switches that control that. Okay, let's see if we're, see if we're started up now. Almost, okay. Um, um, all right. Um, Let's see, cpu.sv, and hopefully I can copy that in there. Take this code, copy, and paste. And, oh wow, it actually does, didn't give me, oh yeah, because I, I disabled smart quotes in uh, in PowerPoint, so I think we should be good. So vlog cpu.sv. Yes, no errors. vsim cpu. Okay, now I'm doing this without a test bench, so I'm just going to use tickle to set things up. To do that, you just right click on clock here. Actually, first I have to right I have to drag these into the wave. And um, and then inside the wave window, I can right click on clock and just say clock. That issues the tickle command to have it oscillate and then reset. Um, I will just do that manually. So I'm going to go back up here to quest to sim. I'm going to say force, whoops. I'm going to say force reset underscore n to one, or no, to zero. That means reset, run and then force it to one and then run. So reset's active low, so when it's low, when it's zero, that means we're resetting. Okay, so let's see how 
everything started out here. Oh, I don't have um, I don't have an instruction RAM actually. I didn't load my instruction RAM, um, and I also don't have instruction. Oh, I just have the top level signals. That's why. Okay. Uh, so if I go back to here and I drill, oh, it doesn't actually show it. Sorry, we got to go to uh, start simulation and then uh, optimization options, apply full visibility, hit OK, go back to CPU and re-simulate that. And I also need some, I need a program. So do I have RARS handy? Hopefully I have RARS handy here. RARS, 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 RARS. There it is. So let me go ahead and grab a, write a little program here that we can test. So I'll do load immediate x0 or x1, uh, 16, add x1, 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 sub um, x1, x0, x1. Okay? So then we'll save this as risk1.asm and I'll assemble it and then I'll say file dump memory, text segment, and I want to select hexadecimal text, dump the file, call it, um, what I call it here? Program.rom, okay, thank you. Uh, Program.rom on my desktop, actually I want to put it in, uh, oh no, uh, da, 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 da. Um, yeah, I'll just put it on the desktop, program, dot rom and then um, I'm actually going to just copy and paste this code into the virtual machine because I don't think I have any mappings there so I'm going to take that go back into here and then go to the shell terminal and uh, say program dot rom and then I will paste that in it's basically just the, the instructions save it and Make sure that's the right, yep, program.rom, and okay. All right, so now, if I go back to Questa, we can restart dash F and run. Oh, also, I'm gonna take instruction RAM, and I'm gonna add that to the wave. Okay, and run that, okay. So I haven't reset it yet, but I just wanna make sure. Now, there's the instruction RAM, so I hit the little plus sign, and I'm gonna, it's got 4,096 entries, but if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, um, you can see at the very bottom, entry zero, one, and two, those are my three instructions. Okay, so that, that confirms that I loaded my RAM. And so I will recollapse that and scroll up. Okay, so I'm going to recollapse that, and then I'm going to add the other signals. So Questa, clock, reset, PC fetch, instruction EX. Let's go to add wave, go back to wave, and then get the clock going. So hit clock, uh, and then go back to Questa command window and type force reset underscore n to be uh, zero, run, force it to be one, run, 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 and then go back to wave. Okay, so there we go. Um, so reset was low at the beginning. You can see the instruction EX is the stall, is the no-op. And then PC fetch is also zero, gets reset to zero. And so it's zero for two cycles, right? So it's, re it's zero during the reset cycle, and then even in the second cycle after it's reset, it remains zero. And then it ticks up to one and then two, and then, it's, then it starts incrementing, right? Meanwhile, the instruction, that's the first instruction, zero, one, zero, 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 nine, three. So that's instruction zero, even though the program counter is already one at that time, right? Which is why this program counter is fetching instruction one. So instruction one is in the fetch stage, but instruction zero is in the execute stage which is why I have those prefixes, PC fetch instruction underscore EX. So I can confirm that if I go back to RARS, 00, I'm oh, sorry, 01000093, and if I go to RARS and read what's there, you can see that 010, sorry, 01000093, that's the first instruction. So if you look at the instructions in the code column there, 
they're going to match up to what you have over here. So there's the first instruction, the 9-3, and then the second instruction is the add instruction, which has 8-0-B-3 is a low order 16 bits. 8-0-B-3, and there's 8-0-B-3 right there. You see that? So this is a, so now you've got like a fire hose of instructions on this signal and then a counter on that signal. Does that make sense? So this is what I was talking about where, I, and by the way, I, 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 the reason why it it's doesn't start at zero, it starts at 100 nanoseconds is because I, I ran it to check the instruction memory and then I added these signals. So I didn't start plotting these until 100 nanoseconds into the simulation. But you can see that the program counter is zero for two cycles. The instruction is zero for two cycles. Yes? I can see that it is, but I'm still conceptually, and this is the last time I'll ask because we're spending a lot of time on this. Um, I don't understand why it's two cycles at the beginning on zero. Uh, I can see that it is on the graph, but I don't have the understanding of why it's two cycles. Well, because it doesn't increment during the reset cycle, that's why. So during the reset cycle, it's forced to zero. Okay. But it, it, doesn't, it, doesn't give, it doesn't have the command to increment during the reset cycle. So in the second cycle, we're not resetting anymore, and it's in increment mode, but it's still at the value zero, right? So we are issuing it like two commands, one to set it to zero, and then another to increment, which takes place at the end of the cycle. Right, because the increment takes a cycle too. The increment is also synchronous, right? And it's it clocked. So like when you're resetting, you're forcing it to zero, and then after you're re done resetting, it still stays zero for one cycle because there's, it is a one cycle latency to increment, okay. right? I can understand that, but I guess I'm then a little bit confused why it displays as having the zero instantly if that part also takes a cycle. Uh, that, yeah, that has to do with model sim. So model sim, you see that clock, there's a little bit of a, a half rising edge there. So that is, I agree with you, that's kind of strange, but model sim recognizes that the clock has a rising edge right at the beginning. And so that's enough to trigger the reset. The reset was, the reset was a synchronous reset. So you have to have the reset asserted, which it is, because reset's zero there, right? Well, technically it's not because it's also kind of going down at that point. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, but the way the model sim's interpreting it as is that you have a rising edge of clock right at the beginning and then it's seeing reset as zero during that so time. Model yeah, I'm not sure how Verilator would handle that. Um, Verilator might handle that differently. Okay. That's, just, that's, just the, that's just how ModelSim kicks things off. Okay, so I that was good though. I, wanted to, I think that was a, a good a way to kind of get you guys, because everyone always struggles how to start with this project. So. Um, this is a good way to get started and see something concrete. You know, you see the instructions loaded, you see the instructions coming out. Okay. Um, okay, so the f I mentioned last time that some CPUs are single cycle, they execute in the instruction, the whole instruction in one cycle. The ARM Cortex M series of processors do, does that, notably. But, which the most popular product having one of those is called a Teensy. They also have something called a Raspberry Pi Nano. I think it's, or no, Nano or Pico? Pico, sorry, Pico. The Nano is the RM11. The Pico, there's a Raspberry Pi or Pico that has that single cycle processor on it, right? Um, so in the single cycle processor, everything that needs to happen inside a, for one instruction happens in one cycle. But the clock, the, there's a, pr a, a very heavy price to pay for that, which is that the clock rate will never be more than 100 megahertz on any processor that does that. You, and usually it's lower. I think if you look at the Raspberry Pi Pico, I don't know what it is exactly, but I, I assume it's under 100 megahertz, right? So it's fine if you have a, like for a watch processor, like a smartwatch or something like a wearable, right? It's fine, but not in any kind of any, any environment where you want more performance. In our case, we're going to go ahead and do the pipeline CPU, which allows you to have a much faster clock. Although we're only doing three stages, so we're not we're not deeply pipelining it. So, you know, there's there's a trade-off. We get a little bit more clock speed by having three-stage pipeline. Um, which means that in cycle zero, you're fetching. In cycle one, we're going to do the decode, meaning read the registers, 
and get the control signals for, each, for the instruction. Um, execute, meaning number crunching, ALU operation, and memory, which we're not actually doing any memory. So I just put memory here because th this is supposed to call back to 212 where you guys covered all five steps of a normal CPU, but we don't actually have a memory, a, a data memory. Okay, so we have a cycle one is decode and execute. And then cycle two is write back. Okay, now the reason why uh, we made it three cycles was because if you make it more than three cycles, then you have to worry about forwarding data. You have to worry about taking results that are calculated but not yet in the register file and sending them back to an earlier stage. I didn't want to, I didn't want to deal with that, right? So instead, we can implement the three-stage pipeline only with the register file bypass logic. And the register file bypass is for if you're writing a register and write back and you're reading it and execute, right, then you want the up-to-date up -to -date value, except the problem is, is that the up-to-date value won't be available until that instruction leaves the execute, uh, sorry, the write back stage, right? So to deal with that, we have the, the bypass, the bypass, which is this line of code here that says, if your read address is equal to your write address and your writing, then don't grab the data from the RAM because it's stale. Grab whatever data is currently being written back and send it out to the ALU. Okay, so that's, that's ne that's, this is necessary because, because of the pipeline nature. If we weren't pipelining, if we did a single cycle CPU, then you would not need that you wouldn't need the register bypass. But because we're pipelining, you gotta bypass, you have to deal with this data hazard. Okay? Okay, uh, so I'm gonna jump around here a little bit. So in lab three, we're gonna implement 22 risk five instructions. We have a mixture of R type, I type, and U type, but there's only one U type. Uh, this instruction, CSRRW, is actually an I type, that's wrong. It's not R type, it's I type. <laughs> as, as noted on the next slide, where that instruction falls under the I type category. So that's my, that's my fault. That should say I type. Okay, is everyone comfortable with R type and I type, what that means? So the idea is, is that every instruction gets converted into a 32-bit value. But in an R type instruction, you use all the bits, well, most use 15 of the bits for registers. You know, two source operands, one destination operand, right? Two source registers, one destination. Whereas in I type, you only have space in there for two register addresses, but you get a 12 bit immediate. You might say, well, what's the immediate if you're doing a CSRW instruction? Um, it's the I.O. register address. So with CSSRW, CSRRW rather, sorry, you have the ability to have 4,096 special I.O. register locations of which we're only using two in this class. Yes? Do you have the, because we're looking through the ISO right now. Um, so there, it looks like there's an error in uh, our ISA PDF. Um, BGE and BGU are exactly the same instruction. Oh, okay. Um, BGE, BGEU. Okay, that's, yeah, that, that does not, yeah, cause the, the, that's, um, that's certainly possible. BGE and BGEU. It looks like the encoding, there's supposed to be an extra one in there, but it's a zero. In, in the 14 to 12 bits, it looks like there should be. Okay. I keep forgetting to tell you. I'll check, I'll check it out, thank you. Yeah, that's important because we're gonna need, um, I believe we're doing both of those instructions. <laughs> I think so. Wait, let me fast forward here and see. I have a list somewhere. Because uh, I have lab four stuff in here as well. Yeah, uh, BGE, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you're gonna be doing BGE and BGEU. Yeah, that, the, the difference, by the way, is branch of greater than, right? Or greater than or equal, rather. GE, greater than or equal. Greater than or equal 
depends on whether you're using signed or unsigned numbers to compare, right? You guys remember from 2, I guess 2.11 or 2.12, if you have a value that's all ones, if it's, a, if it's an unsigned number, that's actually the maximum number you can hold in, in that value, but if it's a signed number, it just means negative one, right? So when you compare values, you have to know whether you're comparing signed or unsigned. Okay. So I think last lecture I got to around here. So this is the block diagram for your CPU, or, or actually it's, it's presented over several slides. The fetch part I've already given you, so this part of the functionality I, I, I've got for you in the, in the slides as your starting point. Uh, the control unit is, is the module or the inline, you know, assigns, the, 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 sorry, the control unit can either be a module or it can just be an inline always statement, always comb. Does that make sense? Depending on whether you like to have modular code or not, <laughs> or whether you prefer to just have everything in one big file. Uh, but basically the control unit is going to take the instruction EX and it's going to convert it from its native format into control values, control signals, that will control the CPU data paths. So it's basically just an if statement. It's just, it's just a big if statement. Um, and then the register file we gave you, but you do have to put it in there and wire it up to um, the, the, the read address one and two, just come from the instruction bits. The reg register destination is also coming from the instruction bits, but because that's associated with write back, you have to delay that address by one cycle with a, you know, just an always, always underscore FF. Pause edge clock. Does it make sense? So the, the basically, the from the register file's perspective, the address you're writing to and the address you're reading from are from two different instructions, right? The address you're writing to is from a later instruction than the one that you're reading than, than the one that has the, the one whose registers you're reading from. So you just put a, uh, a register in there. That's, you know, essentially, that could be done with one line of code, or you can put all your, like, registers in, in, inside one, one, one spot, one always block. Okay, uh, let's see. Yeah, so that takes care of incrementing the PC, fetching the instruction, decoding the instruction, and part of the write back. And that's the same, oh yeah, this, okay, so, sorry, that's almost the same thing here, except in, in this slide I show the, um, this is the decoder that Charles always wanted me to <laughs> include in these slides. So, the, there's a control unit that, that takes the instruction and it, and it converts it into control signals, but the problem is, is that you have to continuously refer back to these bits, right? Bits 6 down to 0 is the opcode, and bits 31 down to 25 is the function 7, and bits 14 down to 12 is function 3, and bits 19 down to 15 is the, uh, you know, RS1 register, right? So you have to keep looking at these bit fields, and so one thing you can do to greatly simplify this is to put uh, 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 an assign in there, basically, or a set of assigns, or, or just an always comb, that renames those. So if you assign, if you create a signal called, what did he call it? Opcode underscore EX, and you assign it to whatever the opcode bits are, instruction EX six down to zero, then when you simulate it, you'll see in model sim, the op, j you'll see a signal just called opcode without having to go and look at the instruction and tear out bits. Right? So that's what the decoder is. That's, that's optional. You don't have to do that, um, but it's, you know, it, it can, it, it'll, it'll simplify debugging and, and the design too, for that matter, because even when you're writing the code, you can not have to write bit ranges out in your code. Does that make sense? Okay, uh, I covered that. Okay, so then we have the execute is 
basically just the ALU. So you take the ALU that we gave you and instance it, and then you just wire it up to the outputs from the register file, the read data A, I'm sorry, read data one, read data two. Now there's a, there's, there's, a core, there's a catch here though, because the second input on the ALU needs to be muxed because, because why? You guys remember why? It's because uh, I type instructions don't use a second register, they use the immediate. The, well, the sign extended? Sign extended immediate, right? So there's a 12 bit immediate field inside an I type and you're going to use that as the second input on the ALU, right? But obviously the ALU is expecting 32 bits, so you have to convert 12 bits to 32 bits and that's when you, you sign extend. Take the, the most significant bit and copy it 20 times to fill in the other 20 bits to go from 12 to 32. Make sense? And, and obviously it's, it's easy, you just use the bit replication operator in system Verilog. Little cur double curly brace thing. Okay, so that's um, that all happens inside the execute stage. So when you look at your waveform, like you know, so you're looking at your waveform, and this instruction is being executed in this cycle. Then, if if you had the decoder inside there, then you would have a signal in there called opcode, right? And the opcode would be whatever the opcode bits are in there, and they would just be, they would just follow whatever the instruction is combinationally, right? Likewise, the register file would be spitting out the contents of the RS1 register in that same cycle. So you'll have a signal in here called, what did I call it? A? I think I called it AEX, right? Um, I believe I called it, yeah, AEX, yeah. This AEX will also be available in that cycle, except it'll be whatever's in that register, the, regi the RS1 register. And because it's an asynchronous read, it'll be available immediately. So as soon as the instruction is fetched, you'll immediately get access to the contents of RS1, the first source register. Okay? So what that means is, is that you're going to be able to see all the signals that I'm talking about will just be, you know, listed under here once you add them to your CPU.sv. Uh, okay, so now the, the complicated part is the write back stage because the instruction has to pass from the execute to the write back stage. Uh, in, you know, in the pipeline, and the way the pipeline is implemented is just through registers, or I, I should say, well, flip, flip flops, you know, multi, you know registers, multi-bit flip flops. So um, you're going to clock the reg write signal from the control unit. So the control unit is has an output called reg write, which is pretty much always one, because I think in this lab anyway. All of the instructions write a register. So that's kind of a, that's pretty much hardwired to one. Now in the next lab when we have, um, um, branch, thank you, <laughs> branch instructions. In branch instructions you don't write a register, you just update the PC, right? But in this lab every, everything pretty much writes to one, so that's kind of a, a, a no-brainer. Um, but we still delay it by one cycle, you know, just so we have it set up for the branches, right? So the, there's one cycle, there's, so the, the, the control unit's going to say, oh, we're doing an add instruction, so that should write to the register file. But then that reg write, you want that to have a delayed reaction. You want to delay that one cycle. You don't want to actually write the contents or the, the result of the add until the next cycle. So in the design, it's very easy to implement that behavior. You just add a delay, a delay, a register. Okay, uh, reg select is the signal that controls the, what value you want to write back to the register file. So the reg write is the way that the control unit will indicate that it wants to write, which as I mentioned, pretty much every instruction in, in this lab wants to write. 
the, the, the address it wants to write to is, is simply a delayed form of the RD field in the instruction. Now the hard part though is, okay, we've told it we want to write, we told it where we want to write to, but what data do we actually want to write? Well that now is, is an option between GPIO in, which is the switches, so that, that will exercise that option whenever we execute a CSRRW instruction, right? Or um, part of the instruction shifted 12 bits to the uh, left, right? Instruction EX31 down to 12, comma, tw and then 12 zeros, right? Or if you have a decoder, you might just call it immediate 20 EX. What, what is that doing? That's for the load upper immediate instruction. So the CSRRW instruction will exercise option zero here on this MUX when it writes back. The load upper immediate will use option one and everything else will use option two, which is just the ALU, the delayed output of the ALU. So that's your add, your subtract, your shift, your or, all those instructions. That make sense? Now, if this was a five-stage pipeline, you know, we'd have to have a lot more pipeline registers, but in this one, we just have, um, I think, just six, I think, in total. There's these, these five, and then there's the one for the RD field. So there's just six pipeline registers. And they're between execute and write back. We don't need pipeline registers between fetch and decode because the RAM does that for us, the synchronous RAM, the instruction RAM, and the program counter, both of which have one cycle delay. So they're kind of, kind of like a pipeline register. Okay, um, so most of this stuff is just structural v uh, Verilog. The registers, though, are behavioral, or you could, if you want to make a register component, some people like to do that, they'll make a module that implements a register and instance that here, that, that's up to you. <clears throat> okay, and then uh, I mentioned this earlier, but the, uh, the I-type instructions will require a sign extender that will sign extend the 12 bits of the immediate field before it goes into the ALU, and that's controlled by a MUX. <coughs> that MUX is controlled by ALU source EX. Okay, so I know this look, looks like a lot, but I've got some examples that clear this, that, that show how all this stuff fits together. So this is the whole CPU. This is my attempt at taking everything from those previous slides and consolidating everything onto one slide. Uh, it's a little busy though, but that's, that's the whole thing. Uh, all those, I, think that's, I think that's complete. I think that's all the pieces you need. Uh, so your CPU.SV simply needs to include all of this, most of which is structural. Just connecting things together. And then there's some behavioral components, which are those registers and the MUXs and the sign extender. Those are behavioral. And you could put all this into one file, or like I said, you can, you can split it up into multiple modules and make, it, and make a hierarchy. Okay, so let's run through some examples here. So I will ask some questions like this on the exam, so make sure that you're comfortable with how to, how to figure out what these control signal values are. So in this case, I'm going to show just these two pictures, which come from the slides, as opposed to the whole CPU, because I think it's kind of easier to read these two pictures, although they're meant to be in the same design, right? Basically, this is, uh, this is like kind of right back, and this is fetch and execute here. Okay, so, and then this is the ALU table. Okay, so... If I'm doing an add instruction, or if I, if, I, if I fetched an add instruction, and I'm executing an add instruction, then these blue columns in this table are my inputs into the control unit. So I fetch the add instruction, which is ultimately just j rendered by RARS, right? So you typed add into RARS, RARS assembled it, you store that in your instruction RAM, and then when you get to that location in your instruction RAM, it's going to spit out the add instruction. Once you have that in your CPU, you're going to inspect the following things. Uh, func 7, uh, then the immediate field, 31 out of the 12-bit immediate field, 
um, the Funct3 field and the opcode. And I apologize, but I don't, Risk v has these control bits all over the place in the instruction. This, is, this part is more complex than MIPS was, because MIPS pretty much just had an opcode and a function field, and that was it. And the function field was, always, it was only in the R-type instructions, right? So this is more complex than MIPS. So keep that in mind. I mean, I, it's, 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 there's, more, there's more stuff you have to look at. But um, some of these are don't care. It's like for the add instruction, I don't care what the immediate is, because, well, it's not even an I-type instruction, so it doesn't even have an immediate field, so I don't care what it is. So there's an X. Uh, the func7 is zero. And the func3 is zero, right? It's starting to look like a no-op, almost all zeros. But then the opcode is not zero, it's 3-3 three, three in hex, right? You might say, wait a minute, two hex digits? That's eight bits, isn't it? But the opcode is only seven bits, so how does that work? Um, yeah, but, yeah, but obviously the, what, the, the, it's seven bits, which means the maximum value you can put in there is not FF, it's uh, 7F, right? 7F would be the maximum value. In this case, it's 3, 3, which is, uh, what would that be? Um, 3, 3 in binary would be 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, right? 3, 3 in hex. You, you have to do the hex from the right to the left, though, right? So anyway, 3, 3 is the hexadecimal value of the output. Now you might say, how in the heck would we know that? You, you have to look it up. It's in the ISA. You have, to, you have to look that up. This is defined in the instruction set architecture. And then you might say, why'd they pick 3.3 for that? I, I don't know. Randomly generated. <laughs> right? They just had to assign a unique code, right? Okay, so what should the, so those are the inputs. Now we have to deal with the outputs. What is the output for the, this, and again, this is a control unit. So what is the control unit going to put out when it sees those inputs? Um, the ALU op, what's the ALU supposed to be doing for an add instruction? It's supposed to be adding. So we have to look up how to tell the ALU to add. Now you guys, we gave you the ALU, so you're going to have to look, you're going to have to look these up. So add is 0011, right? So the, the control unit tells the ALU to add by, by, by setting the ALU op to 0011. And then the ALU source is just 0 or 1. 0 if it's an R type, 1 if it's an I type. Well, what is it? It's an R type, so 0, right? So the ALU source is 0, which, which, which creates the data path from the register file directly in, in the ALU. So when the ALU op, sorry, excuse me, ALU source, when ALU source is 0, it's going to take the output of the register file and give that to the ALU in the second input. We don't have a choice for the first input, that's a static path, but the second input is, 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 is an optional. We have a mux to control that, right? So the ALU source should be a zero. Now, how do you know that? Well, because it's R type. R types use two registers, so we want to take, put the register values in the ALU. So because it's an R type instruction, there's no immediate, then that ALU source should be zero. The register select, that controls, what does that control? Ah, it controls what we write back to the register file, the output, the result, what the instruction actually does, you know, how it changes the, the machine, the processor state after it's executed. And so there's three options there, zero or one or two. Zero is only for the, the I.O. instruction, C-S-R-R-W. One is only for the load upper immediate, and zero is, just takes the ALU result, right? The add instruction calculates the addition in the ALU, and then it shoves that in back into the register file. So the register select should be a two. It should use this data path. So it goes, it, it, it routes that back to the register file. Okay, now the write back though has, is one of those, it's in the write back stage though because there's a delay, that's a delayed, so the control unit tells it to do that but it doesn't actually happen until the next cycle because that, that uh, reg select has two forms, the or execution form and the write back form, 
right? So even though the control unit tells it to set that reg select to two, it's something that's going to have a delayed effect because of the pipeline register. Okay, but that's okay. Control unit's going to say, hey, whenever you get around to writing back, then you know set that mux to two. That's the idea there. And then um, let's see, reg write. Like I said, that's that's just going to be one because add add writes a register like all these things do. And GPIO write back, write enable. So this one is, um, this one, yes. So this one is uh, a little different. So we want the CPU to drive the hex displays, right? But the problem is, is that the CPU is constantly churning, right? You're, you're running instructions through it, right? So you don't want to connect the hex displays directly to, like, say, the register file, or they're constantly going to be changing, right? We need a way to capture the hex displays and keep them there, right? So, so in other words, the only time you want to update the hex display, the output, the, the output of your program on the FPGA board is when you execute that one instruction that's supposed to do that, which is CSRRW. So the way that we have that done, and I don't, you know, this, this by the way, was we came up with this. This is an arbitrary scheme. But we just put a register there that has an enable, which allows you to update the output of their program to the FPGA board and capture it there until the next time around. So basically in this lab, you're going to be converting the inputs uh, from the switches from binary to decimal. And so each trip through your program, you only update the hex displays once. So all the program, all the instructions in your program will be there just to calculate the conversion to do the number crunching, and only pretty much the last instruction is going to update those displays, right? And then it'll happen again when it loops back around. So it's going to constantly update the displays, but only one cycle per trip through your program, right? So that's what that does. So basically that enable is only going to be asserted for one cycle whenever you have that last instruction in your program that updates the displays and puts the value out to the user, right? And that's what that does. So basically that's always zero except for a CSRW instruction. So obviously for an add it would be a zero, right? So let me see, I get that right? Oh, I wish I would have done it by row and not column. Oh well, <laughs> okay. So uh, yeah, so basically ALUOP is the code for add. If I'm doing a subtract, everything is pretty much the same, except I think the only difference between add and subtract is the ALUOP code, because everything else is the same. They both, they both do the same thing. The only difference is the actual ALU operation that's performed. So you'll notice that add and subtract are the same, just the op code, the, the ALU is 0100, which is the subtract. And then multiply, also, same thing. Uh, only difference is we tell the ALU to multiply, which is 0101. 0101, that's the multiply low. Uh, set less than, yeah, same thing again. Just a different opcode, 1100, which is 1100. So all of these write a register, so reg write is always high. Reg select is always 10, which is writing the output of the ALU. None of them write the GPIO, and they all have an ALU source of zero because they're R-type instructions, not I-type. Right? Now let's look at some I-type. Okay, so now I've got an AND and an AND I. So AND is going to be the same as the ones we just covered, just a different ALU op, which is all zero. So that's an AND. See, that all zeros corresponds to that. Um, ALU source is zero because it's R-type. Reg select is two because it's the ALU op. ALU instruction, reg write is one, GPIO is zero. But once we go to the AND I, the AND I has the same op code, the same register select, the same reg write, and the same GPIO write enable. The only difference between these two guys is the ALU source because an AND uses the two registers and an AND I uses one register in the immediate. So this would be used if you're anding something against a constant in your code. Like if you have a constant mask, which happens like, uh, in fact, you'll, you'll use this in, your, in, this, in this lab to, to extract bits out of a value. 
I think you'll probably do some bit masking against the constant because you'll need to grab four bits, for instance. Okay, um, SLL is the shift left logical. Again, it's pretty much the same as AND, just a different AOU op. And shift left logical immediate is also the same as shift left logical, except again, the AOU source is swapped because one's an R type, one's the equivalent R I type. Okay, so um, any questions about that? So pretty much what this is is an if statement, really. It's just an if statement that's looking at the instruction encoding and translating it according to what the instruction set architecture tells you to do into these control signals. And we only have, you know, five control signals here. Okay, here's a weird one. Uh, load upper immediate. This one's a little different. This one doesn't use the ALU. It just takes whatever's in the instruction I field, immediate field, and it just sticks that in the register file, just pretty much ignores the ALU. So the ALU op is a don't, I have it as a don't care. X, I set it to X. Remember, if, if you see an X, that could mean conflict or undefined, but if you put X in, if you actually set a signal to X, that tells the synthesizer that it's a don't care and that it can make it whatever it wants to be because this instruction does not use the ALU and thus I don't care what the ALU op is. However, for that to be the case, um, the, I either have to not write back or if I do write back to the register file, I have to block the ALU because <laughs> I don't want to tell the ALU that its operation is a don't care and then use its result. Right, that's that's trouble because that's give, that'll that'll create an unpredictable result. So, if ALU op is a don't care, then you want to be careful about reg select. So reg select, if that's a one, which is here, if reg select is a one, one is not the input that the ALU uses. So basically, by making a reg select one, I've blocked the ALU. I blocked it at this mux. So the ALU sends a value through this register into that mux and it just dies there because the mux ignores that input when it's selected as one, right? And that's the reason why ALU, ALU uh, op can be a don't care because I don't use its result. It's a don't care because its result is ignored by the mux there, that mux, okay? And why is, why is reg select one for load up or immediate? Because that's what allows you to take um, instruction EX 31 down to 12, which is the immediate field for an I type. It's 20 bits. No, sorry. U type. Ugh. The I type immediate field is 12 bits. The U type immediate field is 20 bits. Load up or immediate actually gets 20 bits from the instruction and sticks it in the upper 20 bits of a register. And so you might say, what's the other 12 bits? Zero. See, it hard codes the other 12 bits to zero right there. Right, so it takes the upper tw 20 bits uh, and just zeroes out the lower 12 bits and then it routes it through that mux back to the register file and that's what we write. Um, so obviously reg write has to be one if we're going to do that. And GPIO is zero because it's not a CSRRW instruction. Okay, now we'll talk about the CSRRW instructions. So I mentioned to you that the CSRRW is supposed to, according to RISC, it's supposed to both read a control register, an I.O. register, and write an I.O. register at the same time. It reads it, puts it into a regular re general purpose register, then it takes a general purpose register and sticks it in the I.O. register. It does an atomic swap. <laughs> in other words, it swaps two values. It swaps in from the I.O. register and it swaps out to the I.O. register at the same time. But we don't actually want to do that because we want to have we want to have one CSSRW that reads from the switches and one of them that writes to the hex displays, right? So the way we've dealt with that, and again this is our own approach, is that we split the CSSR into two rows of the control table and we differentiate them by the immediate 12 field. 
Now that's not actually how RISC does it. This was our own thing. We did this, I don't think we actually have to do this because um, if you, so the idea is that if you read from the, he, the switches, you don't want to write to an output. Like, in other words, we want to be able to read from the switches without blowing away the hex displays, right? We want to be able to read from the switches only, write to the hex displays only. We don't want to do both at the same time. So in order to avoid that, we have two rows where, and the difference between these two rows is you'll notice that their GPIO write enable is only one if the register specified in the, in the CSSR is register IO register two. So the IO register, and we made this up, but I, it's arbitrary. IO register two is the hex displays. IO register zero is the switches, right? So based on that, we have two rows in the truth table. One of them writes to the output, one of them doesn't. Likewise, uh, only the, the switches, which is the input, writes to the register file. So reg write and GPO IO write enable are mutually exclusive here. You see that? It's, you're either not writing to the register and writing to the hex, or you're writing to the register and not writing to the hex, right? In which case, depending on whether you want to write to the hex or read from the keys. <clears throat> so that's how we've, we've set it up. And likewise, the AOU op is don't care. Um, and, and the reason why AOU op is don't care in this case is because um, if we're doing the hex, then we're not writing a register. Reg write is zero. If reg write is zero, we don't care what the ALU is doing because the ALU can't mess anything up because we're not writing the register file. But on the other hand, if we're reading from the switches, we are writing to the register file, but the reg select is bypassing the ALU, in which case the ALU op can be a don't care for that reason. Make sense? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Is reg cell supposed to be, is cell allowed to be four bits there? It, oh, it's not, yeah, it's a bug. Thank you. <laughs> that, that's not, you're right. That's not right. That should be two bits. Yeah, it's a type, another typo I didn't catch last time. Thank you. Okay, um, so this is the whole thing. This is everything I've shown, just consolidated. This is not complete though, because this only has uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten instructions, and you, of course there's 22 total instructions. So I've left out, tw there's um, 12 instructions that I haven't put in here, but most of those 12 just are very similar to the ones I've already shown. I've, I've shown you all the classes of instructions, so all the other instructions will line up to one of these other, that will match up very closely to one of the ones that's already in the table. <coughs> like all the R type and I types are pretty much the same. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, um, okay, so the testing is, a, is, a, is kind of an issue here because Normally, a test bench drives inputs into a circuit and then validates the outputs, right? The problem is there's no way to validate the outputs. I mean, you can validate the I.O., the, the hex display. That's fine. I mean, you run your program and you expect to get a hex display output that matches the input that you put in after having been converted to, from, you know, binary to base 10. But the problem is, is that there's a lot of things that can go wrong, right? If even one bit is wrong in that program, it's going to kill everything, right? There's very little, you, you'll notice in hardware design, there's very little um, tolerance for errors. If anything goes wrong, it falls apart like a house of cards. So the problem is, is that we need to be able to test it incrementally. We want to see how the registers are changing as the program runs, as each instruction runs. So how do you do that? I don't know. <laughs> we haven't never found a great way to do that, uh, except for just taking a test program like this, which, which executes one copy of each instruction, and run it, and while it runs, in model sim, look at, look at the registers evolve in model sim, on, in the register file RAM. One by one, they'll be written. And the comments in this program will tell you exactly what value to expect in each one of those. These, these comments are the answers, but we're giving you the answers not because we're asking you to 
simulate this code, these answers are meant to compare against the wave in ModelSim, right? Now you might say, I thought you said that's a dumb way to, you know, no one tests by looking at the waveform. They use a test vector. Yeah, but we don't, like, again, there's no way to write a test vector because we can't see the register file contents from outside the CPU as is, as is the case in real CPUs. That's inside, that's internal. Register files are private inside. There's, they're not, they're not um, exposed to the outside world. So if you're testing a CPU, there's no way to know what's in the register file, right, unless you have like a, some kind of like boundary scan or something. Right, but from the user, from the main I.O. pins, you're not going to see that. Okay, so um, so we're going to give you this test program. You're just going to run this program, and if you, if all of these registers match up when it runs, and you know that your CPU works at least th for this test program, it's not a, not a very comprehensive test, obviously, because it's only one instruction at a time, one instruction each, right? But um, it's, it's, it's a good start, starting point. So that's the first test program. The second test program we want you to write, and we want you to have, we want you to have it do something cool, something, something demonstrable, something practical, right? And so what we want it to do is you're going to put switch values into the FPGA board, which will then be read in through the CSRRW instruction as a binary value, and then we want to convert those to a decimal value. We want to do a, a decimal conversion and put the decimal value on the hex display. And they might say, oh, wait a second, we, we made seven segment decoders that go from zero to F. If we do a decimal conversion, we won't see anything from A to F. It'll just be zero to nine. Yeah, that's, that's okay. I mean, that, that doesn't matter. Right? So the idea is that you're going to put a number in on the switches and then you're going to get a decimal number on the hex display. So if you put four switches up instead of seeing an F as you did on lab two, you should see a 15, 1, 5 on the hex displays, right? You'll see 15, not F. So how do you do that? Um, I never figured out how to do it in hardware, at least not elegantly. So we're going to implement that process in software and run it on your CPU. So generally speaking, the easiest way to do that is you just use a divide and modulo scheme. You take the value that comes in, and if you modulo by 10, it will give you the rightmost base 10 digit. It'll give you the least significant digit. But then to get the next digit going from right to left, you have to divide the value by 10 and then repeat that process. So you start out with a number, you modulo by 10, you, you, you put out the, the value that you moduloed as the rightmost digit, and then you divide by 10, and then you modulo it again, and you're going to do it eight times. So what's the challenge here? Well, one of the challenges is you've got to do some bit manipulation because you've got to take each decimal digit as a 4-bit value because now we're using binary coded decimal, right? 4 bits per digit from 0 to 9. And we've got to insert that in ultimately into a 32-bit value that we're going to spit out to the hex displays with the CSSRW, right? But the bigger problem here is how do we do divide and modulo when we don't have those instructions? That's the bigger issue. Um, and it turns out it's pretty easy. Well, it's not, it's not real easy, but you can use fixed point arithmetic because if you're dividing by 10 and if you're moduloing by 10, the 10 is a constant. So all you have to do is to divide by 10, you can multiply by 0.1, right? And you can express 0.1 as a fixed point number, right? Now you might say, okay, that makes sense, but how do you do a modulo then? Um, if, if you multiply a number by 0.1, you'll get a fractional result, right? So if you multiply a number by 0.1, you'll get like, like that number uh, 5678 will give you 567.8, right? But then if you take the 0.8 out, if you isolate the 0.8 and you multiply that by 10, it'll bring it back to 8. So that's the way you can isolate the, 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 the digit that you divide it out. Right? You multiply by 0.1, you take the fractional part of the result, you multiply that by 10, and you recover the actual modulo value. Now the problem though is that this is all subject to rounding error because we have a 
you know, we have a limited precision with fixed point. So you may get the wrong number if you don't round carefully here. You have, there is some precision issues with this. It's not perfect. Okay, uh, but that's basically it. And we can do that. Um, we can do that by doing a fixed point where the point one value is 32 fractional bits. So we take the number which is 32 bits, zero fractional, we multiply it by a number with 32 fractional bits, and we get a 64 bit result where 32 non fractional, 32 fractional, right? Which, which divides e very evenly because then that means the multiply high instruction gives you the non fractional part of the product, right? Works out really, really well that way with the multiply high instruction. Um, something I was going to say there, I just lost it. Um, Mm. I forgot. But yeah, that's that's essentially it. So you can um, you can you can do this in the risk five code with your existing instructions. Oh, oh, one other thing. Yeah, sorry, one thing. Um, actually, no, that's it. That's it because we're not doing the square root yet. Yeah, it's basically just convert to t convert to base ten and we're good to go. So that'll be your second test program for lab three, and it's something you can demo. That you'll know from the demo if it's working. Okay, thank you. Remember, next lecture, is, next lecture is optional. I'll still post the recording, but the next lecture will just be a review for the exam.